When they're talking, otherwise cable can't hear us. Um, since we have a few new members, the only difference, um, really, the functioning is the you don't have to do roll call vote when you do the in-person meeting. Um, and then I also did forget to give you motion. So if you want to make a recommendation on anything tonight, um, somebody could move to make a recommendation to the Freeport Town Council. Um, for or against any recommendations that you guys choose to make, you need to find how it's consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, so Sam, whenever you're ready to call the meeting to order, you guys can get started. There should be a little light on your microphone when you're, when it's on. All right, it is my pleasure to call to order the uh, August 4th meeting of the Freeport Planning Board, the first in-person meeting in quite a long time over a year yeah well over a year uh and as you'll notice we are wearing masks here which is a reflection of i think just today maybe the just cdc's updated guidelines that suggest indoor masks for people who are sitting close together as we are so we figured we'd throw them on because it's not that hard uh, so yeah on to item one we hope this is uh not the first and last 
<laughs> in-person <laughs> meeting for a while because um, it's nice to see people even if only half their faces but all right item one information exchange Caroline sure so um, phase one of the Freeport downtown vision is complete that included the survey work compiling the results there was a report and a presentation of the council there is recommendations in that the early action plan of things the town could try to do to get spark some excitement in the downtown area and to get some feedback based upon the values that were identified as being important to the community so if you drove down main street you will have noticed a painted crosswalk which is a traffic calming measure You'll notice like up in front of um, Linda Beans across from the Ella Bean store, there's a white area with some colored lobsters, another traffic calming measure. There's a parklet in front of DeRosier's, which I understand is a big hit. There's some barriers, some planters, and a nice level service surface um, from the sidewalk that people can try out. And if you went to Starbucks today, you might have noticed there's some furniture out back where there's a couple peddler carts and they've done some cleanup there just to create another more lively green space with some seating. As you see out here, there's now some table and games. So we hope everyone gets to check that out, see what they like, what they don't like, make some observations because we'll want some of that feedback as we go forward to phase two. Last night, the council did approve awarding the contract to principal group for phases two and three of the vision. So there'll be some more work going on. They're gonna have a downtown design week, I believe in October, as soon as we get dates, I will share it with you guys so you can publicly participate in that process. And at any point, if you want updates, so we can have Councillor Whitney or Mary Davis who are kind of leading the charge on behalf of um, FEDC and the town of Freeport come and report back to you guys. Um, item two was recent actions by Project Review Board. Last month, they did approve phase three plans, which is the final phase of the corporate campus renovation project for L.O. Bean down on Casco Street. You may have noticed they're ahead of schedule that their building is totally gutted and they're working on the improvements. Part of the next phase is taking down one of the existing buildings, kind of reconfiguring the site with regards to parking, doing a lot of drainage and stormwater improvements. So that was approved. Um, they also looked at some conceptual plans for the desert of maine for some changes they want to make out there um, that's part of the new overlay district that you guys approved they are looking at changing the use to the one of the new uses that was created but also adding a mini golf course out there um, so they'll be coming back to the board soon um, and then i just <clears throat> number three wanted to remind you guys to look at your schedules for upcoming meeting dates um, the first Wednesday of the next few months for the rest of the year, just look ahead and see if you can commit to that. I know it's been a little crazy. Everyone wants to travel now. <laughs> um, so it's been hard to get everyone here. If there's a first Wednesday, you know, for the fall through December that you can't do, just let me know. Come January, I'd like us to adopt like a schedule for the year and you guys can consider for 2022, if there's a month you know that you wanna take off or give yourselves a break, let's get that incorporated in our schedule because you are gonna have a busy year as we need to start that comp plan update um, amongst other things. And then number four, um, the council has asked you guys to look at a couple things, some of which we'll talk about later, but last night the council did take action to make a recommendation that the planning board consider definitions regulations for in areas that would be appropriate for two uses of cannabis manufacturing and processing and cannabis cultivation we have some legwork we need to do behind the scenes we have a lot of shoreland zoning we need to get done first so i see that being a early fall project and i expect you'll have a lot of participation in that so just a heads up that that will be coming your way this fall and that's all I have for info exchange. All right. Uh, do we want to, in absence of Sharon, do we want to skip to item four? Can we do that? Um, move to take an item out of order. Yep. <clears throat> yep. And if someone wants I mean, to. Because we, we can't do a public hearing, right, without the, or can we? I guess yeah, you can do a public hearing. We can take notes till she gets here. We have two members of the public here, so 
I think we can take notes until she gets here. So you can go forward in the order they're printed on the agenda. Okay, all right. Uh, so item number two is a public or will be a public hearing about proposed amendments to the Freeport zoning ordinance pertaining to the Board of Appeals. This will be a, uh, a public hearing to consider proposed amendments to section 104 definitions and section 601 enforcement pertaining to the functions, process, and standards for the Board of Appeals. The language is being updated to provide consistency with state law. And while we're at it, some additional non-substantive text changes are also, or will hopefully also be incorporated. So this item was brought um, to our attention by Nick Adams, our code officer. Um, the Board of Appeals meets pretty regularly, um, but their regulations for some reason have not been updated in years to reflect um, what is permitted for the Board of Appeals under state law. So this is really some cleanup to make our language consistent. Section 104 definitions, the biggest, up, there's really only one thing, updating the de definition of a variance. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're just on the first public hearing, we're just given the background on it. Um, so under section 601, which is enforcement, there's some little cleanup, you know, just to make consistency in wording, getting rid of the he, she's. Um, the biggest changes, if you go through, will be on page three under the Board of Appeals, you'll see that there's been some cleanup to administrative appeals, and then you get into the variance language has stayed pretty similar with a little bit of cleanup. One of the new additions consistent with state law, which we don't have now, is the ability for the code enforcement officer to grant a disability structures permit when there's a dwelling where someone that resides there has a disability. Um, you'll also notice there's some new standards for a setback variance for a one family dwelling. That is just for a one family dwelling. It's not for accessory structures. Um, and there's new standards that go along with that. There's a little bit of flexibility if your neighbor signs off that would allow the board to grant an additional variance. And then you'll see that all the existing setback reduction language has been deleted. That's essentially being replaced with that setback for a single family. Um, and then finally in here, they have a provision for a mislocated building. So if you find that your building was built in the wrong place, that language is not consistent with state law. So our attorney who did review all of this is re advising that we strike that from the ordinance. So if someone has a building that doesn't meet setbacks, they would have options one or two. A hardship is very difficult, to, or sorry, a variance is very difficult to meet because you have to show you have no other use of the property. So if they couldn't do that or meet the standards for the variance for the single family, they would have to go to the council and see if they could get some kind of legal consent agreement to allow their building to remain slightly different practice than what we have had in the past. We do have Nick Adams here tonight, our code enforcement officer. <clears throat> if you want some additional clarity from him, he's the ones that works with the standards on a day in and day out basis. And it is a public hearing, so if you have questions, we can answer those. And we do have some public here tonight. Does anybody have questions for Nick or um, Caroline or internally? I just love to hear what if what Nick. Some, yeah, what specifically? I, that, that's yeah, and I think important to to hear. That'd be great. And what, and what if there's stuff in here that's not specifically state law, or is it all pretty pretty carefully tied to the state it's law? It's all carefully tied to state law now. Okay. Hey, good evening. Um, yeah, so um, in the statute, it's very clear for Home Rule Authority what the, the, the municipalities have for rights for granting variances. And there's actually only four or five or that, that can actually be granted, the fifth one being that the code officer can actually grant one now for just ADA. And there's been several law court decisions that have upheld that, saying that if you have an ordinance that's not consistent with a state law, it's not legal, therefore you're granting an imper impermissible uh, variance. So I uh, worked with Caroline and the town attorney to just update that. Um, it's 
pretty consistent with other towns now around here. Um, it's going to be a little bit um, different going to the board because they have been so used to the limited setback reduction. And they, before, we always called them an appeal. That's what you'll notice in the ordinance. It says limited setback re reduction appeal, and then there's a um, mislocated building appeal. But in theory, what you're doing is you're granting a variance for a dimensional requirement. So by definition of state law in our ordinance, it has to be consistent with the law. So we've been working on it for a little while. I, th I think uh, Caroline and the town attorney did very well. Um, and uh, there is a couple other variances we could have considered, um, but we never had them in our ordinance in the first place. So I didn't think that we really would need them at this time, which is a practical difficulty variance and then an ADA variance for structures other than a single family. But they could always do an undue hardship for ADA if they needed to. So is, are there ways in which this will change the on the ground application of the, I mean, other than the, you know, other than the wording change in this, um, I mean, it's still generally, you have to prove har undue hardship to get the very Yep, so you'll notice in both of them it says undue hardship and it will say, in, um, like, the regular undue hardship one hasn't changed, but the second one that's going to be for, for a single family it says for the term undue hardship as used in the subsection means this, which is similar to some of the language that's in the limited setback reduction, but then it goes into uh, that you have to be a year round resident in order to be to get the single family um, variance, which that hasn't been done in the past. And if you want to do more than a 20%, so say you have a 100 foot setback, if you wanted to reduce that by more than 20%, you'd have to get the neighbor's approval to do that as well. So it's a little bit different. The other um, thing that would be cognizant of the, the setback reduction for one and two families or just one family, you cannot get a reduction to the shoreline or to a floodplain with that. That would still have to be an undue hardship variant. So it's only lot line setbacks, your front side and rear setbacks. It is going to, I think the Board of Appeals will see less applications because we are having at the advice of our attorney to remove the language that's not consistent. Um, so it is going to make it harder if you aren't a single family. I mean, if you're a single family, you'll still have the option under state guidance, proving a strict variance with undue hardship is really hard because you have to show you have absolutely no other use of that property. Again, that variance language is staying pretty much the same, but they're getting rid of that setback reduction and mislocated building because it's not consistent. So. Other questions? Yep. Are there any um, prior actions that this will invalidate? You said that um, prior variances <clears throat> might not be lawful under state law. So um, when a variance is issued by the board, um, they've been instructed by our attorney to enforce the ordinance that we have in effect. So any variance has been granted. There's an appeal period, just like any other um, municipal officials, um, you know, opinion. So they have 45 days from that. There has been a couple that have been issued, but I don't think that there's any um, challenges. Someone would have to challenge that in court to say it wasn't valid by, by law. But there is none that I'm aware of at this point. Are there any, any, cur any uh, current um, applications that this will affect? There is no current ones right now. Nope. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the things with Board of Appeals, you'll see it's updated a little bit here, but they grant certificates and the certificates get recorded within 90 days. If they're not recorded in 90 days, which sometimes happens, they're null and void, but they go with the chain of title and they are recorded in the registry. The other thing I forgot to summarize is that the attorney did add some language just to clarify the procedure for an administrative appeal. Administrative appeal would be something like if the code officer were to make a decision or grant a permit and somebody were to appeal that that process has been clarified there's a few other ordinances outside of the zoning ordinance that allow for appeals to the board of appeals and so that just clarifies a process for that as well any other questions oh we need to open a public hearing don't we do I hear a motion to uh, open a public hearing? So moved. Second. All in favor? No more roll call. <laughs> Excellent. So the public hearing is now open. Would the member of the public <laughs> like to comment? <laughs> Yeah. It was a clue, so. It's 
good to have public yeah. at the first real yeah, meeting. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well. Instead of you trying to figure out who's like on hold on Zoom to like scrolling through. Okay, in, in the absence of public comment, do I hear a motion to close the public hearing? <laughs> and a second. second. All in favor? All right. Public hearing is now closed. Uh, I, I cannot make a motion uh, to recommend this to the council, but am I correct in assuming that the compliance with state law is enough to Yes. Yeah, it doesn't have to be also, comp you know. No, you can just make a motion that you recommend the yeah. proposed changes regarding section 104 and 601 pertaining to the Board of Appeals to the Freeport Town Council as they are drafted to be consistent with state regulations. Right. Something like that. Doesn't even have to do with the comp plan. Somebody want to take a crack at that? I don't know if I can put it into words, but yeah, I'll make a motion that we adopt the uh, suggestions as written and clarified by Caroline uh, in that we uh, amendments to, to 104 and 601 and that it uh, keeps us in line with state law and is comprehensive and, and the comprehensive plan. Do I hear a second? Does that, does that yeah, I think that's fair can. enough. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you got the section numbers in there and yeah. Yeah. The, the law part, so I think that's that's good to go. Do I hear a second? Second. Second. All right, all in favor? Excellent. Moving on to agenda item number three. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Thanks. Uh, agenda item number three is another public hearing for proposed amendments to the Freeport Zoning Ordinance pertaining to solar energy regulations. So... <clears throat> the, the following sections of the Freeport Zoning Ordinance will be discussed. Uh, section 104 definitions to increase the allowable size of a large solar farm in the C1 district up to 15 acres. Section 409, uh, the commercial C1 district to add large solar farm as a permitted use subject to site plan review. Section 412, the commercial 4 district uh, to correct that the existing uses of small solar farm and large solar farm are subject to site plan review rather than subdivision review, which is, I guess, what's currently listed. And section 534, solar energy generation systems to prohibit the use of herbicides on solar farms and add additional performance standards for large solar farms in the C1 district. We now have no members of the public, which should make the, <laughs> the uh, public hearing fairly quick. Um, <clears throat> but we do have some things that we need to to discuss this so this has been sent sent back with a couple of suggestions or recommendations from the council they adopted part of it or they sent the whole thing back yeah so well ironically i think our last public meeting in this room we were talking about this um and it is back so the council did take action um you sent the language that you guys approved to the council they made two changes um, during their public hearing process, they decreased. One of the things you said to them is, hey, we're recommending this, but you guys should consider whether or not you think 20 acres is a good size for Freeport for the large farms. So they struck the 20 acres to have a large solar farm be up to 10 acres. They also took out the use of a large solar farm on US Route 1 South. Otherwise, the language stayed the same. So that lay, everything else got adopted. After that occurred, the council was approached by an applicant for a contract zone for a large solar farm on US Route 1 South. Mm -hmm. um, so, which we talked about, right? Yep. And meeting. so we, yeah, yeah. So we talked, and the council said one other thing. The council did want the planning board to look at the herbicide issue because the herbicide issue came up. So it's back to you to look at the couple things that the council had flagged. So I'm just going to walk you through the language here and then I'll give you, there's a couple you might want some background on. Um, so the language crafted here was based upon your comments at the last meeting and the general consensus of the board. But I know there's a few things that you guys wanted to kind of work out. Um, so at the recommendation of the council, as discussed at the last meeting, the language before you would amend the definition for a large farm in the commercial one district 
So the solar array development area, that area of the panel development essentially, could be between two and 15 acres. So kind of a happy medium between what you originally recommended and what the council ultimately adopted, the 10 and the 20. Section 409, it would add a large solar farm to the permitted uses subject to site plan review. Um, section 412, commercial four, that essentially is a typo. When we put the uses in there before, they were pasted under subdivision review and it should have been site plan review. So not really substantial, just cleaning it up with the intent of the previous recommendation. If you jump ahead to page 13, um, at the top, you'll see a uh, language, what we talked about at the last meeting. We talked about, you know, I think some of the concern of the council seems to be is, you know, do we want solar panels on every vacant parcel on US Route 1 South? Um, it also came up that in certain cases under state law, there's some, or I'm not sure if it's state or federal, sorry, under some certain cases, people like you, you can't own two, an individual can't be tied to two solar farms within a certain proximity. The distance of a mile came up. Um, the council was like, well, we don't want to rely on someone else's standards. If we want such a separation, let's put it in our own standard to require it. So I think of the last meeting, I think we looked at the length of general area being about three miles. Um, so what you have here is that a solar farm, the solar array development area could not be within one mile of another large farm within the district. And then we also have a setback that have to meet a minimum setback of 100 feet from US Route 1. So that's something we debated at the last meeting, whether 100 or 200 was appropriate. And I'll put the maps up in just a second. The other standard you have in here is there's a flat out restriction on herbicide use. Um, we did talk to the town attorney. She said that we could do it for the herbicide. We did have to notify the State Board of Pesticide Control that we were having the public hearing tonight. They have been notified. She felt, the town attorney felt that if the town wanted to regulate pesticides, that would be a different matter and the best way for the town to regulate pesticide use would be through another mechanism that could look at it more broadly, not just for one use. So we're only looking at the herbicide restriction, which is what we talked about before. So I think the big question, which I'm gonna see if I can get this to work. I'm hoping that John or Tom might run in and help me. <laughs> do, we have any, do we have any information that anybody has ever used any pesticide on solar farms? We don't. I'm told that most of them from the consultant, um, I can't remember what she had said about the pesticide, but the herbicide, a lot of them come in and say they're not gonna use them anyway, so it really wasn't looked at like a big deal. Um, the attorney felt like if the town wanted to regulate pesticides, they, they shouldn't do it just for one use. They should look at it for I agree with that. all yeah. similar uses. But then why is it different for herbicides? Uh, you know what? I'm not entirely sure. I think she felt like for some reason it was different with this use where they'll want to keep the vegetation and they need a maintenance plan. Um, all right. Let's see if we can pull this up for you. So one of the things we talked about the last meeting is, you know, we have buffer requirements in here. We have section 527, but we talked about, you know, is it good to put them back 100 feet so they're partially screened or 200 feet? Um, so you have a map that Cecilia prepared for you. The red just shows the district outline. Um, this again this is approximation off the center line of us route one so she drew what would be 100 feet back and you can see if you go 100 feet back it does cut a lot of these parcels down quite a bit in size where they wouldn't be able to have the solar array development area so the way it's drafted is like they could have the driveway off of route one to get in but the solar array development area itself would need to be behind that setback um, we then talked about 200 feet and you can see what 200 feet would do it will really it will limit well either distance is really going to limit the west side of um, 
US Route 1. So it's really just going to be the east side, but it will really limit all those little parcels almost entirely. And then furthermore, you know, these large solar farms do need to be a certain size to make it financially viable. The applicant key that approached the council wanted 20 acres, liked the original standards, but was able to scale their project down using a different technology so that they could make it smaller in size. So the last evening we talked about like, well, how many parcels down there today are that big? Now you have to consider somebody could buy four parcels and merge them together. So, you know, parcel lines do change, but you know, today it looks like we have about a dozen parcels probably that are 10 acres or greater. And those are shaded in blue on this map. Yeah, so we have about 10 parcels today. Um, so I can zoom in, zoom out, show you whatever you need. You have these maps in your packet um, and you have them before you. We got it to work. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and I think we're good. We can zoom in if we need to. Carolyn? Yes. Is Route 1 the only place in Freeport where these things are going to be feasible? Um, what we've been told. I mean, it's hard. The technology changes. So whatever we look at today, we have to, you know, know that it can change. What we've been told is that most of them will want to be near three-phase power because that's expensive. And that typically what our consultant told us is they don't go a mile, much more than a mile beyond. I know that Route 1 South is appealing to some people because it is down here. I've had a couple inquiries about solar. They've all been on the Route 1 corridor you know I've heard some other people say that the cost to extend that three-phase power is going down so it might get more economically feasible but that's what we were told as you guys were forming the standards like before you were on the board the original standards I think one of the things I had heard from the developer was that some of this is like kind of up on high ground so even though it's back from the road it is still pretty prominent because it's on a slope that faces yeah the developer that approached the highway yeah that approached the council was kind of up behind coal river vodka mm -hmm. um so and you know i think so, so even if you have the physical separation it still it doesn't i mean it's still pretty, pretty yeah visible. i think the thing in the commercial district let's just pull it up since you have it here is that they did you have the buffer zones So you did put, um, we referenced the performance standards in section 527 for commercial districts. So the language that you put in the um, text originally was for purposes of applying 527E, front, the front landscape setback mm -hmm. to a large or small solar farm, the solar array development area and proposed structure shall be the considered a structure whose appearance is to be softened and landscaping using trees and pr preservation of existing mature trees shall be required only if such trees do not interfere with the capture of unobstructed flow of solar mm -hmm. light to the technology. So you do have that provision that you did put in the original language. It does give discretion to the okay. project review board. So, I mean, you have a, a couple things. I think the herbicide use is one thing. Um, Amending the definition, do you, originally you recommended 20, do you feel like on C1 it's appropriate to add a large farm back in to go up to 15 acres? And if you do, what do you feel like, if any, should be required for additional setback? I believe in there today you had a requirement which was 50, but do you feel like going 100 or 200 feet is reasonable or something you want to see? I mean, if you're going to do standards, I think we, we, I think you either need to want to allow them or not allow them. But if you're going to want to allow them, you're going to want to make it realistic that they could work, if that makes sense. Do we want to take them one at a time? I think the herbicide one, at least for me, is fairly straightforward that we just do exactly what's suggested here, which is to prohibit herbicide use and pesticide use shall be avoided and maybe we add that to the 
<coughs> long list of things that we should talk about at some point is a is a, a town wide um, sort of blanket policy on pesticide use, which I think has there's precedent for that in other towns, right? Other towns have taken those steps to. Yep, to other towns have done it. So. I think they've and the town yeah. limits uh, limits some use. I think on municipal properties, it's probably something that would be done under like a standalone ordinance, so it might not even come through you, but we could flag it at some point. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, I guess it may not have to do with zoning, but. Um, so does anybody feel differently about the herbicide use? Okay, so I think that one's good. So the other two, the other two big ones are the size and the setback. Uh, start with size, I think, does that make sense? Yeah, yep, that first so, definition. Yeah, any thoughts on, I mean, so originally, you know, we had recommended 20 acres and there were a variety of reasons, uh, not all of which I re remember um, for coming to that number. But, you know, I think the council has reservations about that size. I don't know how many of these, so you could sort of estimate how many, like the smallest blue one, if that's about 10 acres, there's really only one parcel it looks like to me that would allow a 20 acre so you guys did yes, the okay. original standards you did them under 20 acres because that kind of matched the maximum size that would typically be allowed under state law of right. five megawatts um somehow with the new different technology the person that approached the council was able to get it down a little smaller but what they said is like they can produce a certain amount of energy back into the grid, but they make them a little bigger because some days it rains and some days it's cloudy. So they need to capture a little bit energy so or a little bit extra so that they can push, you know, their maximum limits back into the system. So that's kind of why they were looking at a 15 acre. Um, To me, it comes back to whether we want to allow these or not, what you're saying, Carolyn. And personally, I think we want to allow them in the C1 district. Um, I think that the guidelines that we've specified here about, you know, they have to be more than a mile apart. If you're looking at the actual parcels that are available, um, it seems that we've protected ourselves enough from like having the whole route one be solar farms. Um, so I would say I'm okay with 15 acres and I would rather do a hundred uh, setback, hundred feet setback, um, just because I think it makes it more realistic. Um, I also think, I know people have very different views of how a solar farm looks and some people really don't like it, um, but I think if you're driving down Route 1 now, I mean, it's not like it's beautiful. Um, so I don't think it's going to be a huge eyesore. And I also think it signals something about Freeport. Like, I think it shows that we're progressing towards sustainability if we do have someone come in and, and build solar farms. Yes, it's for profit. And yes, it's not directly going into our homes. But just like we're wearing masks right now to signal something and to, to do our utmost responsible thing, I think it also signals something about the town to be driving by and seeing sol solar panels. Um, but that's my, my personal opinion. So. so I think one of the things we've talked about at one point was with those setbacks was that you're also kind of preserving some space right along Route 1 mm -hmm. for the potential future. Does that 100 feet, is that enough to be able to have kind of some backlot development for that but also potentially preserve some space where somebody could come through and do something with yeah, you know, retail service, housing, some, some other use? Generally speaking, um, now different uses have like a little extra setback sometimes, mm -hmm. but in the commercial district, for the most part, given a few special uses, it's 15 foot setback. So uh, with a hundred foot, you know, back, somebody else could definitely have a project there. So you could put, um, like, put that, that would be back. kind of, for me, the key would be like, okay, if you're going to allow this back here, but you're also like sort of incentivizing people to, to save some of that real estate for. Which is also a great buffer use. too. I mean, yeah. if you put a, and yeah. given that, that if you part were to of what, one. what 
the ideal use for, for that yeah, area? You know, I think the one use that kind of, we haven't seen it happen that way, but the standards were changed years ago to like encourage some like higher density housing. Mm -hmm. This parcel where the person approached the council was an old retirement community. They had, oh, the one that you guys mm -hmm. repealed not that long ago. So they had a plan for high density housing. Um, I would say the abutters weren't happy. It was potentially going to be a lot of traffic, a lot of units, um, but it, it never got built out. Um, so, you know, it's hard when you're putting in a district that's not site specific. So you do have to look at the sites available, but I mean, if the, if these lots are, you know, an acre or two and they have to be back beyond this green line, I would say, unless someone merges a bunch of parcels, my understanding is there wouldn't be enough land for anyone to do a solar farm there. That's going to be financially feasible. And again, it doesn't mean that you can't open your business and put your own ground mounted solar panels. It just means you might not see this sprawling farm right up against the road. Do we expect the, the land between Route 1 and the setback? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Do we expect that the land between Route 1 and the setback for the solar array will be um, available as independent lots that will be sold for other purposes? Or might it be purchased by the solar operator? Um, I'm not really sure what you mean. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, if the solar lots are 100 feet back, what's between the road and the 100 feet? Might there be other stores or a farm stand or, or any so other? So, yeah, in the case, the one that approached the council, um, that has like Cold River Vodkas in front of it, mm -hmm. then there's actually, they would have their access up to that higher up land in the back in DeMillo's is on the other side of that. So yes, they, there's some existing uses there. Not to say that in every case. I mean, a lot of our development that the Project Review Board has seen for commercial has obviously been on Route 1 South in more recent years. And I think, you know, they've had a lot of projects that I think the public feels like are an improvement to the area and look more aesthetically pleasing. Um, so you do have some of that already, but there is some vacant tracks. So I think, you know, you do have to be aware, like the one that jumps out, there's like that parcel that's been for sale for years uh, on the corner of Stonewood. I think it says it's like 50 acres. That's really open. So if somebody were to only be 100 feet back, it looks really flat, you, you could see a solar farm and you'd have to rely on that buffering standard to come into play. I'm, I'm imagining that the, sol the, the solar operator who's purchasing the land may purchase everything from Route 1 through the setback, or they may be just purchasing the back lot for the setback and a driveway to access it. So they we don't know which that's going to be. So they, they can have their driveway coming off of Route 1, but they can't have that solar array development area, so that area with the panels between the panels. So you could see... But they, they would, the lot would have to be subdivided if they're going to... They can't do more than 15 acres. No, but, uh, no, they so wouldn't be, like, no, they wouldn't be able to do more than 15 acres of panel areas. Yeah. And that 15 acre of panel areas would have to be, if you decide on 100, would have to be at least 100 feet back. Yeah, I mean, whether or not they... Sorry, what were really, you saying? Well, no, I'm just, it's a really basic question that I don't know the answer to, which is if you, if you are the owner of, say, a 20 acre lot mm -hmm. and you set your solar farm back 200 feet, would you have to subdivide it to do a separate use in that 200 foot zone or could you could you just put in an, an additional allowed use in the district without redrawing the, the I, lot lines? I think it would depend. It would depend on setback. In that district, we don't have like a double the minimum lot size when you have two uses. I honestly don't know if they like to coexist on an on a lot with yeah. others. I haven't seen yeah, any like a that. Restaurant with a um, 200 acre farm out back or a yeah, well, that's kind of yeah, what I'm saying. Not 200 acres. Like, like if you're preserving yeah. a little bit of that area right along the roadway right. for yeah. future, so you could, so you could conceivably exist. have a developer yeah. who comes in and says, do do that? this is what I want to do, is I want to use most of this for a solar farm. And But, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily need the setback to encourage that. That might just be a smart way to do it anyway. I mean, why would, you know, if you've got good road frontage, why would you want solar farm, solar panels, rather, you know, 50 feet from the road if you could, be using that space for something else mm -hmm. so I don't know I think it, for me it's more kind of like the vision of what that right piece of road would look like and I like the idea that there are some parcels where you can put it far enough away but still preserve 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's most of the smaller small parcels small are going to be smaller there. with or without the setback. It seems like the bigger parcels are plenty, you know, it's not like there are parcels that are kind of on the edge. You know what I mean? Like, the, at least the way I'm interpreting the map, it seems like most of the parcels are either work for solar or they don't with or without the setback. There's not a lot that are big enough, big enough without the setback, but not big enough with the setback. Yeah, I mean, you have the Cousins River subdivision. I can't remember how big those lots are. And then you have, I think a lot of the developed lots are smaller. I mean, I do feel like you have a mix. You definitely have some that have significant or I don't know. I mean, everyone has their own <laughs> value of what they think significant road frontage would be. The but on the map appear to have a, a good amount of road frontage and could be visible. But you have a lot of most of your smaller lots, I think, as you were saying, are the ones along Route 1. Yeah. It seems like the two, I don't know, the way I'm interpreting this, the 200 foot setback still leaves plenty of space in the bigger lots. I don't know. I'm a big difference splitter, too. Maybe it's the carpenter in me. I mean, we're about 150 <laughs> feet, you know? It's like. Yeah, I mean, and so this is an approximation. So, right. you know, we yeah. can't get the perfect property line. So Cecilia estimated. So it could be off a little bit here or there. Mm -hmm. What did we originally have? Uh, when you originally recommended it, you didn't have a setback from Route 1, and you didn't have a separation. You just had 28 girl large shoulder farms. So you're adding those additional restrictions. And then as far as the mile separation, it's of the solar array development area. So not just the parcel boundary, but like if this, if there's a solar array development area in one corner and then another corner, I mean, Route 1 is only so big, but just to be clear, it's not from property lines. It's from that solar Connected, array. Like closest area. panel to closest panel kind of. Yeah, I, however, you, I, however you define it. Like I know that you exempted the road because that um, mm -hmm. didn't make sense. But. Right. So, so what I'm st <clears throat> still trying to think out loud about is, is one of the goals that we have to, is to preserve for other uses the space between the road and, and the setback? And if so, how do we accomplish that? Well, I, th I think it's up. I think it's up to you guys, you know, do you feel like could, do you want these things everywhere? Um, is that acceptable to have them all up and down Route 1? You know, I'm not even talking about the solar part. Right, I'm, I'm right. Just solar in general. Solar use between the setback and the road. But the fact that you made them, if you take this as it is, they have to be a mile apart. Right. So they're not going to be up and down. There, that's you know, going to be such a limiting factor because I think it's only, you know, a couple miles long that I feel like right there, unless somebody had a long skinny parcel, which we don't have all up and down route one, it would just, it would be hard to, I think, have that with the separation. Yeah. I think the maximum would be three, right? You might get three, three, solar arrays in here yeah and i don't know honestly i, mean, I don't think anyone knows like how much can the utility support like that's beyond us could the utility even support three tie-ins in that section of freeport um that we don't know and technology is always changing yeah. as we already talked about I, I do like the idea that you know when you have that setback you you kind of you can make it fit in there but you can also preserve the the real estate for something else and I just I'm wondering if that hundred feet is enough to realistically right for a commercial use yeah parking out like, back it, that yeah kind of or thing. parking in the front plus the You're right yeah the building or whether it's 150 feet yeah I don't necessarily um, know that they're gonna do something in their portion that they can't have the solar array development area but I think a lot of those small parcels with the route one frontage by putting that requirement you're making it so they can't have it on the west side of the highway anywhere over there. And then you're kind of protecting a lot of the lots that our existing businesses are on in their current configuration. Some which, you know, have been recently redeveloped. Some could be vacant, but. You could reduce it on the west side of Route 1. 
sort of like the um, idle court, that little array that's right next to the highway. You know, if you reduce the setback basically to zero on the west side of Route 1, but have it on the east side. Yeah, I mean, I think if we see them on the west side, it's going to be more like accessory mm -hmm. to right, there's no businesses. Yeah. All right. I, I mean, for me personally, I, I think 15 acres and 150 feet seems like a pretty good, you know, pretty reasonable um, path forward. Yeah. Other <clears throat> thoughts? I like it. I I'm in favor of as few restrictions as possible on solar development because mm -hmm. it's, it's something that's a good thing to support. So the least intrusive we could be, the better, and the more we encourage it, the better, short of anybody being uh, hurt by any particular project. So that would be 100 percent. 100, yeah, 100 feet. I mean, you or could no. do zero. You, you do don't. Zero. You don't have to do. You don't have to do any of it. That was just the kind of God answer, the feedback. I, think, I I personally think in that section of town, I'd like to see a a decent setback because I think that's a an important part of town. And, and, and if it if it makes financial sense, you can you can do it at 150 feet to make it work and still preserve some potential future uses along Route One. What about we, the mile? It wasn't that long ago we were talking about putting sidewalks all the way down Route 1 South. Yeah. And, right. you know, there's, there's a lot of potential there. So that would be my. So you're saying 150? Right? I would go 150. I'm just, I just off the top of my head, I'm just trying to picture, it, you yeah. know, businesses I've seen, like you come in and part, you know, you got 60 feet of parking plus what it, so you got like 70 feet before you even hit the building. And then the right. building's going to go back so far. So even if it was right behind the building, you're yeah. well over 100 feet for reasonable use yeah. for any type of business. Yeah, I'm picturing like Royal River, either the heat pumps or the grocery store. You know, either one of them is probably 150 feet by the time you get to the other side of the yeah, building. the grocery store is pretty far back. Yeah, right, it could be closer to the road. I think, I think mixed use, you could make it work at 150. I don't think yeah. you can at 100. Yeah, yeah. My problem is I don't know what restrictions hurt projects or make them economically not I think feasible. generally speaking back there the higher the further back you go the better the solar is because it's on, it goes starts going uphill generally well, speaking so I I, you know. I do remember the um, person on the call last time was saying I mean we shouldn't make decisions based on an application but they were what they were saying something about the setback and how they needed it to who knows what it was but they needed it to be like a certain setback or yeah, I don't, I mean, again, with the approximations, it, I don't know if the, if this is off a little bit, the 200 could hurt their, that project. Um, but again, you're looking generally, yeah. generally speaking, you're right. I also wonder, I was curious, and I know I'd asked the consultant about this, but I can't remember exactly what she said, what the average setback was for in towns nearby us like south portland who's done a lot of solar farm work do you have any sense of I that i don't remember that i just know what you guys adopted that if the setback was smaller um in certain zones where you required a bigger setback you were doing the 50 50 and 75. i mean they're structures so if a ground mounted one would be structure so if somebody would have put one on their lot that have to meet whatever setbacks were required for the zoning district down there would probably only be 15 feet. Like Main Beers, theirs is pretty close to the road. Mm -hmm. But you made the regulations easier for businesses and homeowners that wanted to do it accessory. Right. Um, so where were, you, where were you guys at with the mile? Did you? Well, I mean, again, I'm, I have no problem with setback if, if it's not precluding projects and I don't really know that <laughs> where that trade-off you know balances out I, I wouldn't want to foreclose projects because of a setback because I don't think the setback is as important as the underlying goal of promoting solar and I don't think solar arrays personally I don't think they're that aesthetically displeasing so a lot better than looking at some other things that right. yeah. I think yeah cold cold plant maybe <laughs> right. uh, I think I think if if we put it at 150 feet and it's a problem, we're going to hear about it mm -hmm. and 
I mean, is that the kind of thing you could? Could we build in some kind of a, you know uh, application to amend or get a variant or something like that? I, I don't know that th they'd have to go through the potentially new language to prove hardship that they have no other use of the property. Some kind of, some kind of easier standard. I think they'd probably standards. have to. They'd probably have to come back to the board, but I mean. somebody would probably have to apply, go through the whole zoning amendment yeah. process. So there's no way we could circumvent that large process and make it a small process in, for this particular. Um, no, not really. Yeah. Just make, you could make the setback smaller. Um, mm -hmm. Then you could, I mean, then you could make it bigger later if you. I mean, I, I think the abs, you know, nobody's here to give us any information about this tonight. So yeah. I, I'd be in favor of moving forward with, I'm comfortable with a what setback that, that people are comfortable with, which, you know, there's five of us here. Mm -hmm. We can vote on it if it's, uh, or like do a straw vote if it's, you know, 150, 125, 100, whatever I'm comfortable with putting that to a straw vote. My personal preference is 150, but, um, and then, yeah, and then like Caroline said, there's the question of the mile too, which, I mean, I would, I would rather favor a bigger setback and more arrays than, you know, mm. so if we drop yeah, the mile requirement. To is that mile requirement something we came up with or is that state? I thought that was the state. Um, I thought that yeah. was a state law that, that we were state. stuck with. <laughs> I think there is if there's but it's a single owner, right? I think if there's like an owner on here, it seems to say just you can't have them one mile. Yeah, that's thought, what the I language that was before was you. Beyond our control. Okay, right. gotcha. Misunderstood. Oh, so the uh, the attorney said she believes that concept was a concept that arose from the Public Utilities Commission, which prohibits the solar farms from being co-located. It was put in, let's see, the purpose of the rules to implement the legislature's goal of incentivizing small, less than five megawatts, so under 20 acres, essentially solar farms to qualify for the net energy billing program and to prevent solar developers from circumventing the goal by simply placing minimal mm -hmm. separation. Like doing like five in a row yeah. instead of one big one. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, and so she says since then they have evaluated solar farm projects on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, like if they share common equipment, if they have ownership, if they could be interconnected and they've given some rules. If they trigger one of those things, then they couldn't qualify to be these community systems, which is the net meter billing. So that's where it comes from. Um, so she said, in short, if two solar projects are separated by at least a mile, they don't have to go through that process with the PUC to prove they're not co-located. Okay, so it's not a prohibition anyway no so it was brought up it was brought up by the developer during the process and so the council just flagged it and thought if we want to have them a mile let's not rely on other people's rules let's right. have our own rules yeah okay so i guess i i'm not sure i see a need to have them all to put in that strict a requirement that would say we can only have you know realistically two maybe three if the right three parcels just so happen to want to be developers i mean because if like if we say none of them can be closer than a mile to any you know that like if somebody wants to be a developer here and they buy their parcel a year too late they're or who's first in line to right. get a permit or yeah then there's no opportunity but at then all you set them. a limit of you know so many acres but then you're going to say hey five people in a row can all have the same thing you're going to essentially have a hundred acre right like, like yep. that's the, the downside you know i think the other thing you could do too is if you can amend the ordinance and you can flag stuff um so if you feel like you want to do it today with a mile to be overly cautious you could do that we could put it on a work plan to like revisit it in a year and see I, how I it's functioning right. if it works if the set that, I mean, right. if somebody comes to us and is like, yeah. look, I'm three quarters of a mile down the road and here's my, you know, and, and you could revisit it, but. And my solar farm needs to be 130 feet from the road to make it work. 
you know, I, I think another thing, um, you know, anyone can bring an amendment at any point in time, you know, if they have right teller interest, the council can direct you in this area, they can go for a contract zone, but you know, as a board, we've bet we agreed that, you know, the planning boards made language and then it, it goes on and we never see it again. And so this could be something that would be good in a year from now when we have our annual workshop with the council and project review board be like, Hey, how's this working? Like, has it, how has it been applied in the real world? What are the problems or what's, you know, great about it? That's another approach you could take too. I mean, you guys are the voting factors, so it's whatever you want to do, but there's nothing to say you can't revisit it and see how you, how you did and how it really worked in the real world. So I, I think 15 acres, which is basically the mat, you know, the least restrictive palatable mm -hmm. to the council, least restrictive option palatable to the council, 150 feet feels to me personally like a compromise that errs on the side of caution and leaving the mile in place and flagging it for a year. Does that sound like a reasonable? I agree. I agree with that. All right. Yeah. Uh, that's going to require, oh, we got to open a public hearing. It's going to be quick, but do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? It's open. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> do I hear a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Uh, second. Second. All in favor? <laughs> Feed record. Uh, so the public hearing is now closed. Thank you for your participation. If anybody wants to take a crack at that motion, it does seem like the, the most obvious way in which this is consistent with the comprehensive plan is its promotion of sustainability in town. Does that seem reasonable? Which is pretty, you know, that's a, it's got its own bullet point, I think, in the comp plan, right? That Freeport would be responsible stewards of the environment yep. by providing incentive to develop land in ways that don't harm the environment, continuing to improve air water, um, you could do energy, Freeport's energy needs would be met by increasing the use of renewable energy resources, yeah, so organizing there's energy conservation, reducing, I can keep going. Um, <laughs> The only thing I would say if somebody makes a motion, we would just want to be clear that um, somebody was moving to recommend the proposed amendments as printed with the one change that the setback requirement from US Route 1 be a minimum of 150 feet, if that's what you guys are all agreeing on. Yeah. And then revisiting it within a year? Yep, we could flag it to, to revisit in a year. Sounds good to me. So to make it official, somebody has to stare into the void and uh, <laughs> make up a motion. I can try. I'm just trying to find the, where's the setback rule? Oh, I'm sorry. It's on page, page 13. Second sentence. Okay. Um, all right, here we go. So it be moved that we um, take the text as written for the proposed amendment to the Freeport zoning ordinance pertaining to solar energy regulations um, with the one note that in um, Section, what is this section called? Five. There's section three performance standards for small solar farms and large solar farms. The minimum setback for large solar farms in the commercial C1 district, they must meet a minimum setback of 150 feet from the US Route 1 right away and may not locate within one mile of the solar array development area of another large solar farm within the C1 district and that we revisit all of these proposed amendments in a year to see how it's playing out in the real world and if any applicants are having challenges and assess at that time. 
and we and. find it consistent. And we find it consistent <laughs> with the Freeport Comprehensive Plan in that it um, promotes environmental stewardship of the land, um, helps us gain resources using natural resources, and um, is displays Freeport's um, sustainability. Great. That. Excellent. Do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Wait, hold on. Can we okay. do a little further dis quick further discussion? Just a quick question. Um, when somebody comes and does this, is, is there still a provision where somebody's got to put some type of performance bond, performance bond, or something? So, if something goes defunct, it gets removed and cleaned up. Yes. That okay. Is that is not changing. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> second still, second still, uh, still valid. I think. Yep. All in favor? All right. Excellent. If you Oof. if you make a motion to move, do you also then vote on it? Yeah. You, yes. Yes. Got it. Yes. Okay. Just Sam can't make a motion. I just can't make a motion. Got it. One of the best parts about being <laughs> the only best part. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, okay, where's my agenda? So now we're moving on to agenda item number four, which is a discussion of the town of Freeport. Chapter 60, Emergency Ordinance, which was a temporary suspension of certain, or is a temporary suspension of certain ordinance standards to safely accommodate expanded outdoor business activity due to COVID-19. And we will be discussing the possibility of making some of these provisions permanent changes to the zoning ordinance. So, Caroline, is there a some background on this, or have you heard from specific folks in town sure. um, about um, these? So I thought I could essentially give you guys a quiz to get some feedback from you. Yeah. Um, so back in May of 2020, um, when everything started to slowly reopen, the council adopted this emergency ordinance, and it was to support our community all around as they tried to reopen during the pandemic when people couldn't go inside, there were limits, they had to do lines, you had to wear masks, you know, a whole set of rules. And so we have a lot of rules in Freeport. It's, they've made us the great place that we are today, but we have a lot of rules. So you can't have temporary signs. Things need to be historic color. You can't displace parking certain times of the year. You have to get approval when you change your site. You have to provide parking if you want to do outdoor seating, which if you don't have parking, that's an expense. So the list goes on. Um, so in response to the pandemic, this emergency ordinance was crafted, been adopted by the council multiple times. They recently just adopted it to help our businesses and actually our schools use this too, to get through the summer, but it's coming to an end Labor Day weekend. Um, if the situation continues to approve and there's no additional emergency orders from the governor in place, it's likely that this will expire and not be renewed. The council requested that the planning board look at making some of these changes permanent. Um, so I put a copy of the current ordinance in your packet. Um, it's broken down by ordinance. So you guys don't deal with the sign ordinance that would come from the, um, the ordinance committee but you do deal with the temporary activities. Um, so we have limits now um, on the number of sidewalk sales. Like some businesses can only have three a year um, during Memorial Day to the week after Labor Day, they can't have one in a parking lot. Um, we, the other thing, sometimes they'll do a temporary activity and then get a sign. So we loosen some of that. Um, one of the other things loosened with the temporary activity was a provision regarding food trucks. Um, food trucks have had a lot of debate in Freeport. Freeport uh, made it challenging to allow food trucks in certain areas because they were very controversial. We had some people that had events, but they weren't going to meet the threshold of having 250 people, which was part of the requirement to have a food truck. So that got alleviated. Um, we also loosened food truck standards because they had said you couldn't have furniture, umbrellas, or generators. 
Um, and then in the ordinance, you know, we allowed people to make modifications such as outdoor seating without having to provide parking or without having to come to the board as long as they weren't displacing ADA parking or creating new impervious areas. So um, like next door, they put some tables outside on paved or bricked area that was on their property. Main beer, they put a tent up in a parking but didn't displace ADA. They, some people in the village put out temporary signs to say, wait here, a line starts here, wear your mask. And so really, you know, we're looking for feedback as to what kind of things or things that you've seen happen um, in the past year do you think have been good for Freeport and we want to look at making them permanent. We've had, I think the last time I checked, there's about 40 businesses, community groups, schools that have taken advantage of this. Um, you know, if your kids go to school in Freeport, you might have seen some of the outdoor classroom space. Well, they did it under this um, by, you know, putting up some seating and some canopies that met fire code and stuff like that. So looking for feedback from the planning board to see what changes you've seen in the past year um, that you've liked, what you haven't liked, and if there's some that we should make permanent. I like the outdoor seating stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that's cool. I know it's not our jurisdiction, but I really don't like those temporary signs that I've seen spring up around town a few places, but okay. temporary. this is my personal. Um, like which ones? There's a couple, like, uh, they kind of remind me, maybe this is just me being judgmental, but they kind of remind me of, like, a used car dealership type sign that you see. Oh, the like flag. The fa flag. Yeah, the kind of flag yeah. fabric okay. ones. There's yeah, a couple yeah. on Mallet Drive. I think McDonald's had one for a while. Maybe it's still there. So, I, do they have, yeah, yeah. yeah. signage? Right. No disrespect to sure. signage under the sign or our sign ordinance needs a complete overhaul and to make it also consistent with current case law. Um, so you'll see some changes to signage. It signage is kind of regulated under the design review ordinance, right? That's right. Um, but that's good feedback. So, with outdoor seating. It, so I'll give you, I think we have like the village and outside of the village. So outside of the village, two people that pulled permits, um, you know, Bucks Barbecue had a tent last year. What do you think of them putting a, a vinyl tent and do we care what the seats look like or main beer? Were we okay with that tent being there, you know, six to eight months out of the year and then going away? I'll give my honest opinion to this. I, I think anything we can do to support businesses, mm -hmm. um, at, at least on a slightly ongoing temporary basis I think is awesome um, I personally do a lot of work up in Waterville and mm -hmm. some of the stuff they've done in downtown to accommodate yep. restaurants and businesses and things up there is I mean they, they built a whole new sidewalk so that somebody could have outside dining yep. and people could get around it um, this so in Portland and, and, quite a and, bit too. and, yeah. and if we don't if we're not on the forefront of this we're gonna we're gonna miss out um, so you know in the downtown if somebody wanted to put outdoor seating, they would typically come in with a plan. They would show me how they're going to modify their site, where they're going to put the seating, what the square footage is going to be that have to provide parking for that outdoor seating. It's at a reduced rate, but they have to provide it. If they're in design review, they'd have to get a design review certificate for what the furniture looks like or what the umbrellas look like. So, Which is basically every business. Yeah. So I guess question. I guess my I you know I know that people think COVID's coming to an end here, although it's not. Um, but if there was a way to just put a, a temporary pause on it and just give a little a little leash to people, like however it worked, I would support that. I think that's what this version yep. of the emergency ordinance was. Mm -hmm. um, our business community has seemed to like them. So I guess in the village. Does everyone think outdoor dining, seating, and benches are a good thing? Oh, yes. yes. Um, do parking super complicated? Some of you have spent a lot of time talking about that. Oh my gosh! Yes. <laughs> do you feel like if somebody has some tables and chairs, and let's just say accessory, like it's not just an out, a fully outdoor seating restaurant? So someone like Linda Bean, they have indoor seating, they have a little bit outside, you know, six to eight months of the year. Do we feel like they should have to provide parking? Gosh. Or are we going to consider that accessory? No, just because I don't so want to talk about parking. <laughs> I would. I don't. I, I don't know how we. 
exactly how we handle this, but I would until it becomes a problem. I mean, we've talked about the excess mm -hmm. of parking and okay. yeah. we still no, have developed all these parking lots and all the stuff that we had talked about two years ago. And I think I, where there's parking, if there's a, an opportunity for people to yeah. bring people into town and, um, you know, and somebody yeah. that comes I, and eats also stops and buys something somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And I, I know, agree with that on 100%. a temporary ongoing basis, I would totally support. And I would even support, I, I think the parking one in particular, you know, for outdoor seating, like maybe it, it should be limited to this, you know, from the, the light at West, at West Street by the fire station to Mallet Drive, you know, the parking spots that are on Main Street, to me, if those all went away, there'd still be plenty of, I mean, I know some of them are close to, you know, but if, but if an individual business has some right to, or, or gets, you know, wants to control the, the parking spot that's out in front of their business and rather than, you know, have a patron park in it, um, if they want to use it for outdoor seating, I feel like that's a totally, every single one of those parking spots. Yeah, we... Until it becomes an issue. As the um, town has tried to implement the early action plans, we've faced a lot of challenges, one of them being that U.S. Route 1 is a state road, so yeah, anything we do has to get approved by the state. So we're really talking about that. stuff not on the road but it's rather like if somebody has a wants to put a thousand square feet of parking i'm sorry outdoor seating right now they have to provide the parking requirements so we take one per 300 and then we i think give them a 45 percent reduction and so if you don't have parking that could be essentially 50 to 75 dollars per space per month that our businesses are having to have that outdoor seating so if it could prohibit people from putting outdoor seating, especially that's where if it's I think small. It's, yeah. I think with the excess of parking we have right now, yeah. on a temporary ongoing basis, I would absolutely support. Um, so the last question for outdoor seating is that currently it requires design review. How do we feel about the aesthetics of outdoor seating? And so earlier you referenced erosion, and I noticed that this morning that they have these really ugly you know, road construction type barriers. In, yeah, we have to Street. have those for safety. That's that's one of the town pilot projects. There's nothing but yeah. more aesthetically pleasing than that. That could be. My understanding is we need to have those, Just but. Screw some. Um, so, for example, like he, um, somebody put nice planters out there, or, mm -hmm. you know, there's L.L. Bean donated some furniture that's up there. Portland has done some of that where they put up the. You know, they put up the like Barrier. bridge construction yeah. barriers. But I know but then uh, what you're saying. Yeah. Somebody goes into the yeah. parking lot right off Main Street and puts up like a giant pink tent with colored flags all over it. And is somebody going to be like, "Oh, wait, we didn't see that coming?" Yeah. So, like for ex <laughs> for example, like um, we just had somebody come to the board on Mallet Drive where the laundromat is, and they're going to do outdoor seating as part of their plan. And to the project review board, because they're in the design review district, they brought cut sheets of what their furniture is going to look like. So right now you have to get approval for that. Do I wonder, is there like a, a happy medium, like where they don't have to get staff re staff review, staff approval? Sorry, I know that's a burden <laughs> um, on staff. But I, I, if it were like, I don't know, what do you do? You go to the local rental places and say, hey, can we have cut sheets on your most popular chairs? And we say, all right, these ones are okay. If you want to rent this chair, it's fine. I mean, I guess something like that. Well, I think the other thing too is we could some, you know somehow tie a limit to it as well like from you know memorial day through labor day or whatever you could like put some days, like you can have some time period some type of that you could do town planner approval review. if you want to have outdoor yeah, seating like that. yeah that's a good idea something like that and if you want to keep it for longer than 90 days you just have to go to the project review go through board the process in that 90 days and you can keep i mean it so let's see if we did like may six june days. july august either fall summer and and then if you're going to be there longer than that, that's a, a right. enough gives of you an the impact time that you to can take put the time out to there actually go through a, a little more parking. Little so more do you think process. that's long enough to support our businesses? So that means, I mean, essentially, if we did that, that would mean come Labor Day, all the outdoor seating could go away. I mean, we're in Maine and we still eat outside in September, we but through yeah. Indigenous Peoples Day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some kind of process to temporarily allow accessory outdoor seating to make it uh, easy, uh, less regulation, no subject parking. Subject to your approval. Okay. 
That, that I, I would do, and then if somebody yeah. wants to be there all summer long, then maybe there's a little bit more of a process you got to go through. Yeah. If somebody wants to just throw some, something for like two months, or it should be easy. Yeah, I think you're right. I like your the ideas you guys have come up with to make it yeah. temporary. Because if you want to do it eight months out of the year, like we have some people that do it today, that's fine. But if it's really like a permanent thing, then you should. I sort of like the, your the idea of like, you know, I mean, I guess it, it does put the the business owner at a little bit of risk if they say, okay, I know what I want to do. I'm going to go out and do it and then go through the process. You know, if you invest the money and then you don't get approved, but it seems like the chances of that happening. Yeah. You know, some of the people that have had tents though this year, they've rented them. Right. Like yeah. they're not buying them. And you know, I think the other thing is, is it, it's almost, one, it, this has given people a chance to try something right. so they can see if it's worth yeah. it. And I think this kind of it, effectively a grace period, right? Where you have, you know, you can try something, and you, if yeah. you don't like it after 60 days, yeah. you take Forever it down. sitting here trying to figure out how Freeport's going to reinvent yeah. itself. I mean, this is like the perfect, mm -hmm. yeah. great opportunity. Yeah, it's like opportunity. what they're doing with the downtown vision in phase one. You know, they're doing pop-ups, they're trying things, seeing what works, seeing what mm -hmm. doesn't. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, okay, and then everyone's favorite subject, food trucks. <laughs> <laughs> we have talked about them before. We had an applicant bring an amendment. We made some changes on Route 1 South. We talked about some general changes. Um, we do feel like, you know, I, staff, and I think I would say applicants, feel like there's a lot of paperwork involved in our process. Um, I hear that there's fees. And, again, it was developed that way because we wanted to be strict and we wanted to have them on special events going on downtown or accessory to certain types of business, but I know this board has talked about maybe loosening some of the standards. So if they wanted to have a couple chairs or they wanted a generator or other things. Um, so how does the board feel about food trucks in Freeport? Are we comfortable with only allowing them in our downtown area during special events? Or do we feel like we want to see more of them? More of them. Mm. Cautiously. Yeah. The my problem or not problem, but my my thought is what I really would like to see in Freeport is more restaurants. Mm -hmm. And so if you bring food trucks in, does that discourage I don't know. Yeah. I I mean, food trucks sometimes turn into restaurants since they're successful. Yeah, yeah. Totally. I think that was kind of the totally initial the concern of what from what I remember about this yeah. when we had the applicant come up and actually it's been shown like in other places in Portland for sure that food trucks have turned into restaurants. Um, mm. But I, I think we definitely need to loosen Yeah, maybe them. that concern is overblown. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Lee's was a food cart that turned into a restaurant, so. Yeah, yeah, that's a good example. Um, Athena's Cantina started as a food truck, and then they did brick and mortar. They're down on Route 1 South. Um, Mr. Tuna, who's somebody that has a food truck, yep. he has an application to come in. I don't know if he's rebranding himself. Sorry if he's watching. Um, but <laughs> he has an application to open a brick and mortar in yeah, Freeport. El Jefe was. was. But, you know, we do have some longtime brick and mortars that right. whenever the planning board talks about this, they come in and say it's a struggle for them in Freeport, downtown Freeport. And in the winter, and they rely on every dollar, and so they do feel like this competes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, one of the things, if right now the way it's set up is to have them in the village, you need to have a special event. A special event is a defined permit in the town of Freeport. We are expecting 250 people or greater. People aren't doing those large events right now, which is the standard that got changed. But I guess, you know, when you want more food trucks, Wayne, I'll call you out. Mm -hmm. Do you want just one to come pull up somewhere or do you want like a, a food truck court so it's like its own little special thing? Or do you want something going on so you can go to a concert and then do a food truck? I think a court would be nice, but <clears throat> I think in general we should just ease the restrictions and mm -hmm. let people do what they do. I don't think it should be our priority to protect businesses from other businesses because we're just no, all winners and losers there. Um, so I think we should allow competition. You know, if they're really aesthetically bad, I think we might need to look at some kind of regulation. But um, parking becomes an issue. Right. But yeah. people want to, if they want to come there, they'll be there. If they think they're, you know, unappealing, they won't come there. Um. I think one of the things we talked about in the past, and I and, and I do get that, you know, the brick and mortar people like they pay taxes and they they've, they've been here, they've been established, and and 
they're a lot more invested than somebody that just rolls in and a try and I totally get that part but the other thing we talked about too is you got to have a lot of standards about like where the trucks go because if you were to build a restaurant and and we talked about this with main beer company like you're abutting residential property and is that truck going to be where like a normal part of a building wouldn't be that close and it's going to be like you know a generator running or like it can have a lot of impact mm -hmm. on you know it just like shows up and parks on the corner of a lot and it, it, it's, there's a lot of stuff to think about i, I think, think in here that. i think they still had to meet like the suffix yeah um you know and then who's enforcing that and, and then you they're coming and going so. it, it is hard because they do come when yeah. town hall is not open and we don't have our one code officer on staff who's who's very busy so chasing food trucks or some of these smaller things is hard but it's important to people because it's survival for our brick and mortars and our and our food trucks so it is really tough you know the way it's set up now <laughs> is that if they're coming an accessory to a host business like they need to sign off that people can use the bathrooms they need to sign off that people have trash so if you just say food trucks can come anywhere we could run into issues where they don't have access to trash they don't have access to bathrooms and I'll a lot of our stores close early we we know that so it could leave people coming here with no trash no bathrooms um stuff like that we have the one that just opened by mass landing brewery is that something we approved or you approved um great question so the nighthawk food truck they show that on their site plan they can have a food truck their accessory to artisan food and beverage which is what mass landing is um, that gentleman was going to open brick and mortar and it wasn't ready so he's doing a food truck and then once that little brick and mortar there is ready he's going to move into there and then I don't know what his intention is but that will there's plenty be. of room in that Shaw's parking lot because that, the stores are closed <laughs> yeah. yep. so I'm not into, other than Wayne liking food trucks I'm <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think the, the event, the event number like you have to have 250 people to have an event seems a little bit ludicrous to me i think that should be struck i th mm -hmm. is there agreement about that aspect of it or i mean i guess the yeah so if you wanted to have food trucks just for the sake of food trucks you'd come in and what get a permit for an event for 10 well, people i think if you wanted to make an event like right. if you wanted to have like a food truck Friday event and somebody was willing to host you as the property owner right. they could pull a temporary activity permit yep. and then the way it is now the food trucks would then each get their permit so you could do it that way if you got rid of that 250 threshold so that but that doesn't reduce I think it's a good idea it could, but it doesn't reduce the paperwork no so what I would probably bring to you is something to modify some of the food truck provisions that you've talked about before if you wanted to tweak it so they could come for a special activity i'll call it instead of the term special event we could do that i think you know if you maybe wanted to and when i've talked to local businesses it seems like the brick and mortars are okay if people are coming here for like something special that's drawing people but you know if you want to look at just opening up downtown entirely then i you could have a workshop we can invite you know the people in downtown i think that's what you did before isn't it were you on the board then oh. or you could have invited people and nobody came which sometimes happens <laughs> yeah I, 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 and i would bring I, changes in the paperwork process Mm -hmm. yeah I, th I think if you could streamline it that to me would mm -hmm. but I don't I don't think it's a good idea right now to wholesale just open it up to let anybody come in and park a truck and and, and make it that that easy that not that easy but that right where it is I, I, I think we need to exercise a little caution incrementally and the I, under, have, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I, I have a thought have we considered the people that do have the Places that you, I, I don't know what they're called. Um, there's some vendors that, either like by the, um, ah, when you go into the brick mall. Mm. The oh, like the hot dog carts? Yeah. So, what, that's their competition then. Those? And, we, and what do they have to do to get those places? And 
thought that's the lottery. Those are peddler carts. There's peddler two carts. types. There's mm -hmm. peddlers on public property, which Anna just said is regulated by the clerks, and they have a lottery. There's like five or six spots, but nobody ever wants to be in front of Town Hall or the fire station. <laughs> so there's like a handful that are used. Um, on private property, they would have to go through, get approval to go through site plan review. Uh -huh. In my almost 20 years, we've had one person come in. Wow. I think they operated for a season. Otherwise, the ones that you see have been in place for a long time. You know, we don't have a ton of space on the sidewalks for those to park because a lot of it is town land. Um, so we haven't seen a lot of new peddler carts. They are heavily regulated. They're licensed from the state. They're inspected. They play less of a fee than a food truck. Okay. Um, but they do have standards of what they can have, what they can look like. Uh -huh. Just like food trucks, they're not supposed to have chairs. They can have one sign. Don't tell me if you see other things out there right now. Um, <laughs> we'll assume they have a permit. Um, so they are, they're pretty restrictive. Um, the town and FEDC years ago did look at, for a while, people didn't want those. And they did look at changing standards or not allowing them. But the standards didn't change and they remained. I just thought... Wow, isn't that a com competition mm -hmm. then with the food trucks? Yeah, and I would say over time they've kind of disappeared. I think okay. some weren't as successful given their location. I think one underlying value is that there's a, I think there's um, a lot of people believe there's really not a lot, a lot of great food in Freeport. Mm -hmm. A lot of people go to Portland for, for dinner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and anything we could do to bring better food into Portland, to Freeport, I think would be helpful. And some of this could turn into brick and mortar. You know, who knows? Right. Right. Okay, so I think you gave me some guidance. We'll do some tweaks on the food truck based upon past discussions. We'll streamline the permit process as recommended by staff, which will work on that language. And we'll look at making some incremental steps towards making our rules a little more business friendly to bring some food in the village, but not open the doors wide up. Yeah, I like Anna's idea of lowering the barrier for an event. I think that's good. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't know who's counting people. <laughs> right. Code enforcement's out there at night. Yeah, yeah, the special right. event. Say, oh, I expected 250, but only 20 showed yeah, up. Yeah, the so. special <laughs> event permits all go through PD, and depending what they're doing, a lot of times, like, they need to have patrol officers on. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. If okay. something yep. happens and 250 people show up and it's chaos, I'm pretty sure that would get calls. <laughs> yeah, it's happened saying, before, like, if you say yeah. there's only 250 and there's only 100, like, who's... But right, if, you're, if you're playing for yeah, 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 Once in a while, them. people will pull them. With. Or sometimes, like, you'll have, you, people will pull them if they're going to have less, like, if they're going to have alcohol. Or, you know, they need that police presence. Okay, so I think that gives me some guidance there. Um, we're working pretty hard on the shoreland zoning stuff to get it to, so I don't know that you'll s think ideally you'd see it in September, but I just don't realistically think we can get it back to you that quick. Caroline, sorry, just one last thing about the food trucks. I know we've talked about it for a long time, but I noticed that the they're advertising the Freeport Farmer's Market by the grain. Yes. And one thing that I've heard was really successful in the Yarmouth Farmers Market that's on Thursdays is that they start they had food trucks there and that got people to come to the farmers market and really helped them customers shop for other things. So I don't know if there's any way that yes. you can make it easy for them to also have food trucks. So somebody did approach me about that and the problem there is there's a part of the problem there is there's a zone change and so that's village one which covers like North Main Street, <clears throat> more of like a transition zone. Um, so it did make her hard. And they, right now, they don't have the draw to trigger that special Where is the event permit. The Grange is like kind of across oh. from Key Bank. Oh, no. yeah, yeah. From um, but maybe. If you lower that threshold, I think it would open it up for them. And if you include some standards like Greg's saying, they have to meet setbacks, be away from residential properties. Yeah. But that's it what might they, make that viable. Okay. Those are the kind of things I really would like to. That's help V1 with. back there? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's, yeah, they're like the first V1 right. property back there. Um, Anyway, sorry. Just no, no, that's a good point because I know there, like, if there was somebody interested. I know there's a lot of community interest in farmers markets. They seem to 
be hard to pull off and make successful, although we have a lot of successful ones around here in Cumberland County. Um, okay, so farmer's market. And if they pull a temporary activity permit for that, then they could do it. All right, anyone else have thoughts on any of those or? Good. Good. Item five, everybody else, all set? Yeah. So item five is a discussion on the remote participation policy for the Freeport Planning Board. So this has been adopted by the council? No, um, or yes. Not discussed by the council. Right. But they've said that if individual boards want a policy, then they need to create their own. It's basically. Kind of. Sort of. Okay. Um, under state law, we weren't allowed to have virtual meetings and have the board participate in be an active member. Um, I think we all saw a different group of people participating virtually. We had some of our biggest meetings ever. Um, so some new regulations were adopted by the state so that municipalities can continue with remote meetings in certain situations, but they have to adopt a policy for each board or committee that wants to have them. So we have to, would have to put an, a legal ad in the paper, say we're having a public hearing on remote participation policy, would have to have um, a hearing and then would have to adopt it and then we could be good to go. All right, we might want to, would probably want to have the council just acknowledge it. Um, so the council just adopted one. What you have here is a policy drafted by Maine Municipal Association. And these are basically the rules if there's something you didn't want to allow. But basically what it says is that the board is expected to be here. So it's not made for you to sit at home and do your meetings from home every month in your pajamas or it's not made for you to stay home when there's a controversial application so that you don't have to be here in the boardroom it's made for if you're away on vacation you're out of town on business you could participate but if you're going to allow the board to participate virtually they need to have to give the public the same opportunity to um, tom the new cable guy we'll call him has been working really hard to get this room up and running so that we would have the ability to have the board here, have the public here, and have more public and board or board on the screen and that everyone could participate. Um, my understanding is that the difference, one of the differences with this is that the person on the screen would now be visible, whereas when we were doing stuff on Zoom because of issues, um, yeah, they weren't always visible. So it would look a little bit different. Um, we'd have to give notice of meetings. When the council adopted their policy, they said that they would always do it unless there was like a technology reason that they couldn't. Um, one of the things, not really for you guys, but if you were to have a large meeting that we couldn't have here, if we were to have it like at the library, we might not have that capability there. Mm -hmm. um, so we really would want to make sure that we continue as a board to meet in this room if you want to go hybrid because that's what that large TV there would give you the option. So if it's something the board's interested in pursuing, you can take this. If there's stuff you don't like, um, you can flag it and I can get legal guidance to see if it's something that we have the ability to tweak or not. Um, if it's something you want to go forward with, I'd be happy to prep it for a subsequent meeting. Probably we would look at it at the same time we look at the rules of order, which we already talked about. We just have to bring back to you. Yeah, I'm sort of, I mean, if I were going to, I guess I would support a, a hybrid policy almost for the public participation first and say, you know, the board should be here. But if members of the public want to participate remotely, then that's okay. Um, that's, I mean, I'm not really opposed to, to the board, you know, certain, you know, board members being able to participate remotely either. So, but I just think it's more, you know, it's, I, I, I guess what I, what I thought was great um, was seeing all the participation that we got when it was, you, you know, we lowered that barrier to participation in a, in a meeting where you don't have to, you know, 
miss your whole dinner bedtime routine if you have young kids or whatever it is you know you can just he wasn't around when we did parking <laughs> and we filled this room yeah <laughs> <laughs> before your time um. i was here for uh for the the previous uh cannabis round though uh, yeah. Had, yeah we had a lot of people for that i mean you did get good participation almost every meeting you had somebody on the yeah, zoom was, platform um we don't we can't do it yet tom's working on it but we'll be back to streaming to facebook and youtube we're, we're working on all that but Every meeting, there was always somebody watching you on Facebook. I can't see the YouTube, but you do have a following. <laughs> and it's become more of an expectation in the public because after a year and a half of pandemic, people right. have gotten used to dealing with remote uh, connectivity. So I, I think we should keep allowing it and um, you know keep being permissive that. Plus, we don't know what the course of the pandemic is going to be from here on out. So it yeah. might, maybe still a necessity to accommodate that that's a good point you know i have heard we have a couple people that i know are homebound or they're caregivers to family members that are homebound and i know they've been actively participating via zoom because they can't be here um at night yeah that's another point too if you guys don't adopt this and the state rules don't change so that everyone can go hybrid you know if you have people that have to go back into quarantine or can't be here for illness or if wayne has a cold or you know something like that I think that's a good point, too. This will give you a little bit of flexibility to get through the winter. Mm -hmm. Environmentally, it's better, too. They don't have to drive here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that's right. right. It's like I mean, I, I, I don't have a super strong opinion, but, I mean, I, I think it is valuable to be here in person. Although we're probably a week ago we would have all been here without masks, but things are changing again. Yeah. So right. um, who knows what's going to happen. So and, yeah. and, and, again, I do, I'd like being able to get whatever feedback we can get so if mm -hmm. i do yeah i think it is not, it's nice to call in or uh, that's great i like yeah. how it's drafted it's not like oh we're you know the board members are just going to be home now sitting in front of their computers like we should be here unless yeah. basically there's something super urgent or an emergency but we're right we're mostly adopting it for the public to be able to have more participation yeah or like we've had people that like travel for work and have gotten stuck in snow or sure, bad yeah. weather or yeah, I mean, it does say they're expected to be physically present, except when not practical, like emergency um, or urgent issue that requires it, to be there, remotely. I remember something coming up at one point where maybe it was Bob Ball had called in, but he oh, wasn't yeah. physically, and he couldn't vote because he wasn't on video. Oh, or, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Like so this some, will. Will this address that? Or Yes. Yeah, so okay. he could have sat in a hotel. Now, if you adopt this. As long as you give the public the same opportunity, if he's traveling for work, he could sit in his hotel and do the Zoom meeting and participate and vote. And the only thing that would change. Well, he was, but it was, but, but it was because yeah. he wasn't physically like he was yeah. on the phone or something. But we didn't have his image, so he couldn't yep. vote because you couldn't physically see him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, yeah. Which later in the pandemic, the town attorney changed her advice they, okay. and said All you right. could. But yes, okay. this will clarify that. Um, like we, Peter was saying, like we've always had the ability that like we could have somebody telephone in, but you guys caught in. Um, so sounds like the consensus is that the board wants to move forward with this. Yeah. Yep. With the understanding that it's not really for the board unless it's a case of emergency, that's really to increase public participation. What was funny because in July I was like, oh, I can I can participate. I'll be on vacation, but I have Wi-Fi. And then it said in person. I was like, oh, I guess I can't. Yeah, I yeah. know it is. So was it, well, that that'll require a update, right? We'll have to go through the public hearing process and everything for that. Yeah, that I mean, if we're just going to adopt pretty much what the council has, it's just a tweaking of the wording. We could get a public hearing yet. So even next month, the goal is that you guys are going to do shoreland zoning where we met with DEP. We're working really hard on that. The technology isn't available, so I don't know that you can do hybrid for shoreland zoning, but you actually, you wouldn't be able to do it next month, but right. we could put this policy hearing. on your meeting next month so that. What's the notification? Do you October. have to send a piece of mail to every person in town? Um, no public notice in the paper, legal ad. Okay. All right, because there's no abutter. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah, there's no abutter. Um, okay. All right, everybody good with that one? Item number six, discussion on an upcoming workshop with the council and the PRB. 
project review board, including possible dates and topics for discussion. We've done workshops in the past. We usually do an annual uh, council workshop. And I think the last, I don't, when was the last PRB workshop, joint workshop? Was it right before the pandemic? The only one I think you've ever had yeah. was... Yeah, circle of chairs out front. Yeah, it was... Gosh, how long ago was that? It had to be 19, 2019. Yeah. Yeah, because we would have done the second one in 2020. Yep, and then well, this would have been our third. So, yeah, it was 2019. It was here, here but yep. it wasn't the full, maybe it wasn't the full board. We invited um, planning board, project review board. We invited council, but we didn't get anyone to come. And FEDC, which Keith McBride came to. Yeah, we had pretty good attendance from the boards, though. I thought Councilor Egan was here for that. Maybe I'm thinking of something else. Oh, anyway. you're no, you're thinking of the workshop, I think, where you uh, and Robert okay. went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, I think there's a lot of value in those workshops. Um, I don't want to, I don't think they should happen all the time just because we don't have time for that necessarily. Mm -hmm. If they, but I think, you know, once, once a year with each or maybe twice a year with the PRB uh, could be valuable. Um, so I know you guys talked about having one. I think there was interest in early fall. Sam had recommended that maybe we wait till at least later in September so everyone can get back to school and back through summer and vacations um, and all that. You know, one of the things that when we talked about the village stuff we flagged was wanting to revisit that, whether it be the overlays or design review, that was something that we started pre-pandemic that you never got any feedback from the council because, you know, I think life changed yeah. so drastically for everyone. So I think if that's something the board wants to, you know, maybe pick back up, um, you're going to have the cannabis coming up. I think you could hear from the project review on, you know, feedback, what, what new issues are working or not working, and then anything else you feel like you might need some guidance from either board or committee. I don't know if there's certain topics. So I guess if anyone has any topics, you can share tonight. If you don't and you go home and you think of something, then you can let me know. Um, did we do a legal workshop with that to Sam? Do we have the town attorney for the, like the first time? I've never hour? met the town attorney. We used to have a guy, Phil, now we have Amy. Right, I've never met. Yeah. An MMA uh, meeting where we, we attended the MMA's legal workshop. Yep. Do you remember that? Oh yeah, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Oh, was that oh. online though? It was online. Oh, okay. No, I thought we had one. We had the town attorney. Um, or if you guys think of topics later, you could email me. What I, do you... I, I would love to, and I think we're going to have to, as part of the comp plan process, to mm -hmm. at least consider... Well, that's, I guess that's its own reason to talk to the PRB is about the comp plan process. But then as part of that, I think we're going to want to keep in mind the village various overlays and design review and all that stuff. I think I, I would love to pick that project back up in some form when we can. Yeah, you know, I think, yeah, we have got to get going on the comp plan. As soon as we get the shoreland, that top priority is to get that RFP. We just got the funding available July 1, so we have a hundred, I think it's a hundred thousand dollars total mm -hmm. to do the comp plan. We've um, talked to GP Cog. I know there's other groups out there. I think we decided we were gonna use a consultant. We want to have a hands-on approach. Um, but we'll send it out as a package deal. So that will start. And what that once that starts, I think we could be looking at needing to meet a little bit more frequently than once a month, depending what we have um, going on. But I think if you can get, if you're gonna, if we wanna resume the design review overlay discussions, which I think there's interest from both boards and FEDC, I think it'd be really good to talk to council. If you talk to council about it, and know that there's interest from them, then I think that's something we could pursue over the winter and fall. Um, we just need to be aware of people's schedules and who has time to commit, right. you know, to volunteer an additional meeting, knowing that and you're going to be the, the council. I mean, the council interest, I think, because we've talked to the council before about that and gotten sort of generally positive feedback mm -hmm. about pursuing that. I mean, I, is the next step to go to the council and say, hey, this is what we want to do, give us, not give us, but can we appropriate a certain amount of money for? A consultant to draft language or whatever well that's what we were going to do before so i think if you 
went to the council with the PRB, the PRB could explain like the inventory they had done and what they have and their thoughts. You guys could give your thoughts. Um, I think if there's interest, if the board worked really hard for a couple months, we did a working group before, which is something else you could do. Mm -hmm. If you worked really hard to see what you want, you could potentially get a line item budget request in for early winter, like January, February, before they start the budget and get it in next year's budget cycle. That was our problem before when the pandemic hit, we had to pull back all the budget requests because nobody knew it was gonna happen. So I definitely don't feel like it's something, it's something we need a professional, I think, and a fresh set of eyes, you know, whether it be a landscape architect or some other design professional, um, because it sounds like people want some graphics and some real clarity so yeah. yeah i to me that's a fairly high i mean we've been talking about it for mm -hmm. years now and we haven't it's like I've, we've been thwarted yeah. every time i tried to do something <laughs> so i feel like we got to figure out how to move the ball yeah. on that issue it's jinxed <laughs> yeah seriously and i know it's a big it's not an insubstantial project you know it is i think timing wise though it could work good to get figure out what the boards want and get a budget request in yeah. so what's the deadline then for that budget so we'd have to have something some sort of proposal together by I th a year so kind of year? the working group men and they were kind of like stock on really what they wanted what you know we, we could get the notes together and kind of revisit where they ended up but they really they got stuck on what they wanted and how they wanted to go forward so i think we need to figure out what exactly yeah. they want you know the other option is we can definitely do band-aids which isn't what anybody wants but if we need to fix it in the interim get the comp plan done and then do budget requests or put it out till after the vision that's your other um I think we already know from phase one of the vision some of the values of our community and i think protecting the historic nature of our downtown is something that our residents right. feel strongly about but doing it in a way that's practical for the community as a whole is important yeah can we uh how do we go about getting those notes collated for next month or the month after oh meeting? just to kind of revisit it just to kind of revisit and say okay this is where we left off where, what's our next step? Um, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, let me pull those together. I know I have a bunch of them um, pulled together. Let me see if I sort can. Sort of remember, we talked about wanting one set of guidelines mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and doing away with overlays. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Let me, because we had a Ben and Sarah from North Star Planning right. were helping us. They, were and they there. Robert. Yep, they had done there. notes. Um, yep, Jamel was there. That's right. Yeah, it was Jamel. No. Yeah, it was Jamel. Um, yeah, I think that's a good point, a good place to start, and I'll put it on the agenda for September. Okay. Given that there's nobody here, assuming that nobody wants, although, I, well, I guess that any, anyone on the board could address the board, right, on non-agenda items. Anyone? Great. I'm good. We have a plan for next month, I think. Yeah, you guys are going to be busy. Yep. So that's September 1st is the next meeting. Um, that's the first somebody? Wednesday. Yeah, look at your schedule. If so we need... After Labor Day? I'm going to be no, gone. No, Labor Day is like this year. It's, it's late. Okay. Yeah, so it's a, I think it's the 6th. Right before? Six. Okay. Yeah. I read something. The kids were going back to school before Labor Day. And nothing's on the 1st, right? I'm going to be gone on the 1st. You're going to be on the first, but um, there's nothing on the first. Right? Well, the September no reason first I wouldn't be is here. the first Wednesday of September. But it won't be that day, right? Well, that's won't remind it. The first Wednesday in September is when you are scheduled to meet your way. I can't make the first. Okay. I'll be here. I will be here. Pretty sure I'll be here. Do you, okay, do you want me to send an email to everybody and confirm? It, the shoreland zoning, we have to send about 800 notices. So if people are pending with back to school and life and Labor Day, we would want to find an alternate I will, I will be here. Yeah, I, I, I'm. Like you're ready to sign up in Sharpie? 
Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just I have a second Wednesday of the month commitment with yeah, the, the industry organization, so I can't I'm like sometimes when yeah. I try to put it off a week I can't. I can't the second it. Wednesday is hard because coastal waters meet. Coastal, oh, yeah. Which has, could have some Wednesday? Yeah, they meet the second Wednesday, so there could be some overlapping interest. It can't be a can't be a Thursday or something like that. Um, we could potentially switch the day of the week. Um, I, ha I hate to switch the day of the week and confuse people for something that big, but we could. The third Wednesday is booked, so that would put you into late September. Well, I mean, if not to intentionally cut you out That's of the meeting, Wayne, but um, if Robert and uh, Aaron are available we still could potentially have a quorum and oh because labor day is really late labor day is the seventh yeah that's fine and currently there's no vacancies for our planning board is, are there no or there's no vacancies no um we do have a vacancy on project review they were doing some interviews the other day um terms typically expire in march so that's when would have unless people um resign okay so i will send a note out as long as we can at least get the five people I think we're good um, I wouldn't want to do all that notification if we only have four and just we'll have to make sure people can really commit um, when does report go back to school anybody know um, yeah I think they go I think the 30th yeah oh, it's so early. that's back to school yeah. week good reason to get out of the house oh. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Still on camera. You're on TV, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be chaos, so. Okay. So why not? Yeah, boy, it'll be good to get Shoreland done, that's for sure. So. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So move. Second? Second. All in favor? All right, meeting is adjourned. Never use this gavel. It'll be kind of exciting. You can